Hello and welcome back to Getting Open with me, your host, Andrea Miller. I have such an incredible guest today whom I will interview officially in just a moment. Her name is Ophira Eisenberg and we cover a lot of very meaningful ground, including when breast cancer is funny. Yes, you heard that right. When and how to write your own narrative, even when things are really dark and really tough. We even talk about how, when you should ask for flowers. Yes, we cover that and so much more. Let me introduce my amazing guest, Ophira Eisenberg. Welcome to, oh, and by the way, we changed the name of our show because oh. it was open relationships and now it's getting open. So sorry about that. It's like, ah, what do I say? <laughs> All right. Uh, getting open. All right. Uh, somebody just like yanked me. <laughs> Welcome to Getting Open with me, your host, Andrea Miller. I am so excited to introduce my amazing, hilarious guest today, Ophira Eisenberg. Ophira is a stand-up comedian writer and host of the podcast Parenting is a Joke, as well as a host and storyteller with The Moth. Ophira performs live regularly and brilliantly, I must add, across the U.S., Canada, and Europe, and is a very popular fixture in New York City's comedy scene. She has appeared on Comedy Central, Kevin Hart's LOL Network, HBO's Girls, The Late Late Show, The Today Show, VH1, and so many other cool places. She is also the author of Screw Everyone, Sleeping My Way to Monogamy. And that's only a little teeny tiny morsel of, uh, <laughs> of her amazing resume. Welcome, Kira. Thank you, Andrea. I know it's always so funny hearing your credits. And I mean, it's so nice. But then sometimes I go, God, should I just focus on something already? <laughs> Well, listen, so I mean, it, it's it's obviously not easy to build such a successful career in this creative space, especially as a female comedian. And that gets it actually as a mom, it gets to my my first big yeah. question. You refer to your husband, Jonathan, and your son, <laughs> who is now eight, a ton yeah. in your material. You can be really tough on your guy. Um, <laughs> and it can be very revealing. I'm thinking about some of the uh, sexting uh, requests or oh, yeah, sure, sure. in there. Um, yeah. uh, how, how, does, how do you draw the line or do you draw the line as a comic with your family life? A little bit. I mean, basically, um, I like to, I, I like to work personal. Like that's the stuff that gets me going as far as stand up. Some people, their entire act is a lie. And sometimes it's funny because I think an audience is used to that. So people will come up to me after my show and go, do you really have a child? And you're like, wow, you think I lied about that? Wild. Uh, so I, I yeah. do go from autobiographical I, you know, I would say my husband has seen all of my material ad nauseum so many times at this point. And basic rule is if it, if it gets a laugh, it stays. But I also, I never, you know, he, everything that I've thrown out there, he can handle. There was one joke that I wrote that he didn't like because it was a little bit more insulting towards him. And you know what happened? That joke never did particularly well. So it got taken out of the act Fun. anyway. And then with my kid, you know, this is a ever evolving situation because I do think when kids are very little, it's much easier to use them in your comedic material because privacy feels very different. And you're right. talking about more universal experiences. But as your kid gets older and maybe totally. even is aware of what you might be saying, I'm, I yeah. will have to adjust that. We are going to have to go into much more um you know creative freedom there with making stuff up <laughs> yeah, yeah and that i feel like that that's been a big topic of conversation among a lot of creators i feel like especially creators who happen to be moms whether they're comedians or they're social media influencers it's something we've dealt with as i've been doing my show right. and um have started becoming more active on tiktok i've gotten um I've gotten in a little bit of hot water <laughs> with my, you have. Uh, especially my older teenage son. Yeah. And then sometimes my husband's like, yo, 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 that's a little too much. 
I'm like, all right, let me pull it back. So have you ever had to apologize to Jonathan or was it literally just like that one time he's like, that's that's not cool. And you said, OK, great. It didn't work anyway. Yeah, I think I actually battled him on it. I was like, I think it's funny. And then it didn't work. And, you know, if you don't believe in something, it's pretty hard to sell it, too. So I think I think there has yeah. to be, you know, and to be totally transparent when it comes to like the social media and putting stuff out there. A lot of times, because he's a professional editor, I will have him edit my clips. So I'm like, well, you're going to you're going to see all of it. anyways. <laughs> Yeah, there's although, no hiding. Let me lean into it. Although yeah. I will tell you, I have a document, a Word document that is, you know, just called like the jokes I'm working on. And he was uh, unemployed for a quantity of time. And I had a joke about, I think it was literally something like uh, that I love him less. And I was just trying to toy with this angle about people with unemployed spouses or partners, how that's a very tough partnership at times and but that's as far as yeah. I got and I was traveling and I I took a different computer and I said hey can you send me this jokes document of mine because I'm just trying to work on it and I guess he opened it up and he just sent me it with a little note saying uh love from your unemployed husband who you love less oh and I was like snap oh my god he's like <laughs> fork to the neck he just he gutted you he just he and, shivs you yeah, and I was like, what do I do with that? Do what do I and you know what I decided to do? I said nothing. I was I just um, end of conversation. <laughs> I'm gonna try to yeah. I'm gonna see if we could just click into that thing of like you probably won't want to bring it up again. And so if I don't bring it up, it will just go away. <laughs> yeah, then it's gonna go away. <laughs> Anyway, oh God, so that was hilarious. that was I, I mean, did come my on, what a wow. good what a good sport. Yeah. I think yeah, you gotta be. That's kind of a that's kind of a ninja move that he he got you that mess. I mean, in a way it really is as funny as it is, it's also like a way for him to communicate with you without um being a dick about it. I mean, like that that was kind of a pro move, if you ask me. Yeah, I know. I I uh I was like, wow. I, unless you're like, yeah, and I totally use that material, and that is like the name of my new show. <laughs> then you're like, yeah, no, that didn't work at all, dude. Yeah, no, I was hoping That's to never so use that material. My goal was to get rid of that idea yeah. as soon as possible, and it happened. So great. Moving on from that bit. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. I mean, but that, but that is, I mean, listen, I mean, just genuinely, Jonathan, if you ever listen to this podcast. I mean, major props because, you know, you you have been tough on him. And as somebody that's creative, he gets it. And it shows, if you will, like what a um, just what a confident man he is, because a lot yeah. of men would would not feel comfortable at all having personal stuff revealed about them. And so it, it, it's really it's it's actually really cool. Yeah, I you know, but he's he also um, gets he gets some good good coverage in the act because I do have a joke about him being a nerd, but in the same joke I say you know he's very good looking, and trust me, he brings up that joke all the time. Yeah. Oh, one of my favorites. Oh, one of my favorites. I'm like, uh huh. <laughs> yeah, got it. Let me actually ask you this: Have you found, and this may seem like kind of a, a weird question, have you found because this is, I mean, it is so personal, and you're talking about your relationship with your husband in a way that's really open and very there are very few um people probably that are watching your show that are also you know making their living doing what you're doing but has anybody ever said to you that your ability to work with this this really personal material that they've actually somehow internalized that in their own lives a little bit i mean i, I think know. i mean maybe that's think... just a weird yeah, no, I think I think what you're getting at, which is something I strive for, which is sort of the reason, you know, the raison d'etre to even do this kind of entertaining media yeah. is that I, I feel then, alone. Like I feel alone and stuck in my head all the time with how I'm feeling and how I'm processing. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes I go, I wonder if this thing that feels so personal and vulnerable to me, other people are also feeling mm -hmm. personal and vulnerable about. Mm -hmm. And if it works, and sometimes it doesn't, but if it works and if that connection is made, 
that is the ultimate goal because that is that intimacy from the the large to the to the you know small and the intimate from the large performance to the person and the dialogue that I am looking for that makes me feel less lonely and I assume that makes them feel less lonely and then I feel like oh we're we're feeling like that's where humanity is like we're going to be okay because it gives you this feeling of like we're all in it together yeah. Yeah, well, totally. And you're right. I mean, in a, in a big way, it is the raison d'etre of doing the kind of work that you do. And it takes, I, I realize, just so much courage, both to reveal yourself, to reveal things about the people that are close to you, all in service to helping others go, oh, my God, I'm not alone. Yes. Thank you for telling the truth. And thank you for telling it the truth in a way that I can frickin' laugh about it. Like, that is the, that to me is, like, the genius of comedy, right? For bringing us together, especially in a world right now that's so frickin' divisive. I know. Where we all just want to claw each other's faces off. Yes. Yeah, I know. That is especially at this exact moment. Uh, and I do feel like some very okay. subtle, I think, subtle material compared to what other people have in the political realm, just pointing I to do. things, you know, tensions right now. And at this exact moment, when I tell those jokes, they go over very differently. There's a little bit more of an ooh in the crowd because you can just yeah. feel that yeah. people are tense. People are tense. Yeah. Um, what's off limits for you? Off limits. I mean, I just, um, because I'm working from the personal and, you know, I found, I found this more when I was writing, like when I was writing a book or even when I do storytelling that if you, I should always be, I, you know, we were just talking about my husband's the brunt of the joke, but if I think most material material, if you really listen to it, I'm. I'm the brunt of my jokes. Like no one else should ever be a yeah, victim yeah, yeah. in my jokes than me. It should always come back to me. Uh -huh. And I think, because I think otherwise you just get into, you know, it's pretty easy just to crap on someone or take someone down, I th you know, to be critical like mm -hmm. that. You can be critical of culture. You can be critical of the mainstream. That's still yeah. what we say, punching up. So I always try to be very mm -hmm. thought thoughtful of just the way I write and the way I talk that, you know, at the, it always has to come back to me. It always has to, that's what I want to do anyways. I'm a narcissist. Yeah, no, but it, uh, it always should come back to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes there's some sensitivities in my turns of phrases that I don't even realize until I throw it out there and then I go, Oh, they're hearing it this way. I have to change that. Cause there's no point. Yeah. You know, so yeah. many times in this world, people will say, oh, you do stand up. And then they go, is it really hard to do stand up right now with all the political correct correctness? Like, do you feel censored? Like you can't say things on stage? And I'm always like, no, I feel fine because mm -hmm. I'm not racist or homophobic or sexist or putting down other cultures. Like, what do you talk? What do you think? What do you think people are sensitive about? You know, I just, I think that's that idea that the political correctness has ruined comedy. It's like, well, what comedy were you looking to consume? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there's, I feel like there've been, I, I don't purport to be a, an expert in the space, but, sure. but I do feel like there've been a number of high profile comedians who have, complained about that right yes. that every like you can't get away with being funny and irreverent like you could before so and, and you know and I realize now um oh, it's so tricky right because in part to go to these taboos is it, it can be funny and relatable in a way that makes you just blush and go whether whether you're guilty or you're just part of the, the culture that is guilty of it it's like oh yeah like they just they just said their burr has no clothes in a way that we're all cringing, but we're all nodding our heads to it, right? right? And so there is, I mean, I do I feel like there is a public service in talking about these things, but you've got to be really, I mean, it feels like you've got to be just walking the tightest of tightropes to, to pull that off effectively, because otherwise you are a racist, xenophobic, misogynistic a-hole, right? Or, you know, or it's like, what do you, what, why, you know? And that, yeah. um, I feel like it's hard, but you're able to avoid that because you make the joke about yourself. 
Yeah, and I think there's there's a lot of subtlety in there, which is where you're talking. It's like the, the people that are working with some more subtle stuff, yet they're being thrown in the barrel of all of the... Because uh, there are plenty of people out there who are making a good living doing stuff that is hate, very hateful, you know? And mm-hmm. there's an audience that's like, oh, what's yeah. wrong with this? Yeah. And it's like, I, I think there's something wrong with it. <laughs> I'm just going to say. I believe in freedom of speech, but yeah. I, don't ha- I, don't, I don't have to like it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and I feel like that uh, I was just actually listening to an interview with Bill Gates and it was talking about First Amendment and all the stuff. And it's like, oh, you know, yes, we we want people to be able to express themselves. And at the same time, you would hope in a capitalistic society that when they do and they're saying things that are really gross, that the there would just be a a modest amount of um, a, a modest um, consumer base for that. Right. Yes. But, yes. And, you know, I comedian know. I mean, Judy feels Gold. Like maybe there's opportunity for more, you know. Sorry. I was just saying comedian Judy Gold said the the greatest thing about it. And she talks about this a lot. And she just says, like, just be like th- if you're in a culture where they're coming after the comedians, that is a problem. Like that, sh- that should not be your, you don't need to come after the comedians. There's a whole bunch of people with a lot of power above those comedians that those people let's mm-hmm. first talk about that and then we'll we'll get to the comedians yeah she's just like she's i'm 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 adding my commentary to her thing but she is she is full on freedom yeah. of speech because she's just like if if um you know if i can't say whatever both sides should be able to say whatever they want and if you silence one side then you silence the other mm-hmm. side which is a very good argument yeah yeah it i feel like it is um it 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 ultimately comes down in my mind so much about the delivery and the intent because if to your you know the point we were talking about even a little earlier it's like if the intention is um to be hateful and divisive th- that comes through and it appeals to certain people if it is meant to be funny and and you're able to pull off even if it's irreverent and a little dangerous that combination, you, then you can pull it off. But it really, it feels like it comes down to the chemistry and intent of the person who's saying it, right? And that that's pretty unique, yes. right? Yeah, and we live in such a soundbite culture where things are, you know, clipped out. Someone could be talking about something for an hour, but what is taken out of it is a 45-second clip that is running on TikTok and Instagram, which, of course, is, could sound completely different. Completely out of context. Yeah, no, totally. Well, You've gone, you've gone through some really tough times that you talk about in a lot of your work from, and you've been so open about um, some of these really dark periods that you've gone through from losing your best friend in a car accident uh, when you were very young to surviving breast cancer, uh, getting pregnant at a, at a late age unexpectedly, but then it was like, (laughs) you, you, you wanted this baby and then you miscarried. And it was like, you were, I mean, what you describe how, it, it was like you wanted to destroy everything. You wanted to burn everything down. And I could feel it in, in those words. And um, and so I'm curious that you've, you've been open about um, your, you know, your experiences with breast cancer and so forth. But when you think about those, um, those dark periods, have you been able, do you feel like you've been able to turn them into comedy back to what we were talking about? So, so women that go through, you know, cause I haven't, I haven't listened to every single thing you've yeah. done. I'm wondering how much do you use that dark material now? And at what point uh, you said, I think it was comedy, oh, um, tragedy plus time equals comedy, right? It wasn't, there was nothing funny when you're going through this stuff. Absolutely. Right? So I'm wondering at what Absolutely. point, at what point is breast cancer funny? Yeah, right. Exactly. It took me, I mean, I think I first started talking about it and I started talking about it in the context of The Moth, which is a storytelling organization that does, you know, t- you, you tell five to the 15 moth. minute okay. yeah, true stories from your life. And it's a podcast and a radio show, but it's, it's also those stories, they don't have to be funny. It's great if there is, they have some levity, but you can, you can tell a, a super sad story. So I, it took me a little while to write about it, but you know, the process of writing about something, and I think this is why people journal just even at a personal level Mm -hmm. is gaining ownership of the narrative. And Mm -hmm. that's very important because when you feel powerless, (laughs) you do not have ownership of the narrative. That's the, it is the exact opposite. So while I was going through it, 
I sur- I just felt powerless. But there was a little bit of my mm-hmm. brain, I guess, because I, you know, this is my my creative work is my life, that I was constantly thinking while I was going through it, and I was in terrible states of mind. And I just recently was talking about how I was a I was a bad survivor. You know, I was not a smile on my face while I was mm-hmm. going through everything. Survivor. Well, I was not even nice to a lot of the surgeons, nurses, et cetera, that were taking care of me. Sometimes I was sharp and mean with them because I was so full of rage and, and fear. And um, I think there's sometimes pressure to be a good survivor. And I think especially for women to have your smile on your face while you're going through breast cancer. I mean, how demeaning is that? So while I was going through it, I felt all of these things and I thought there's got to be other people than me that feel this way. There's got to be other people that are like, do not tell me to have a positive attitude right now. That is not where I'm at. Yeah. And, and it also like a little silencing, like, Oh really? And who am I supposed to be positive to? Who's, is that to make it easier for you? Is that who it's for? Just to be clear. Yeah. But I, you know, couldn't express that. And I, but I kept thinking I need to tell the story at some time. But what I need is to get through this because I need this story to have a happy ending. And that mm. was like the closest I could get to me being positive going through it. I was like, one day I'm going to tell the story, mm-hmm. and I need it to have a happy ending because if I want it to connect, that's people, an amazing anchor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I did it with I I mean I felt like I had the same thing when I was you know I got pregnant accidentally and then I miscarried I actually miscarried twice but the second one was a very scary miscarriage and that was very dark and I just kept thinking how what what's the what for me is going to be the happy ending out of this what is it is it a, a child free life how would I write that story. Is it a life with a child in it? How would mm-hmm. I write that story? And I, because I didn't know ultimately what my, what it would be, but I kept thinking about it that way. That was, I like talking about this. We all use this, I don't know, I guess inspirational saying about like, you got to live in the present, you got to live in the present. And I, I completely understand that. But also sometimes when terrible things mm-hmm. are happening to you, especially I, for me, I relate to that in medical um, scares and health scares, you are forced to live in the present because you're in a jail mm-hmm. of the present because you don't know what's happening next. And what is freedom is to think about the future. Yeah. And to think about like what that happy well, ending would be like. Yeah, totally. And what I, I mean, what comes back to me is, with you and, you know, you have a unique opportunity since you reach so many people in a way that's so personal that it's like, it's writing your story for yourself, but being really in service to other people, which to me ultimately is what it's freaking all about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's like, you know, there's a gentle rule. There's no uh, hard rule, obviously, about, you know, t- talking about this stuff that's very personal, like, oh, if you've gone through something like cancer, you know, you, you don't maybe talk about it on stage the next month because that might still be mm-hmm. you're like you might be processing that's maybe more of a therapy <laughs> like thing later like you're leaving the hospital <laughs> I mean famously yeah. Tig Notaro did that and you know that was a, a groundbreaking moment for her as a comedian and for people watching yeah. comedy of like what it could be like so again there's no hard and fast rule for me I think yeah it took it took a while before I could wrap my head around what I wanted to say about it um, that that also that I thought would be useful for anyone because what happens on stage, what happens in your journal, what happens with your friends and family, maybe that's different. That is very different than from what happens on stage. And what happens on stage is a little step back. It, it forces you to have a little bit of objectivity about a very personal experience. Mm-hmm. And so it's a little bit of distance. Mm-hmm. And that uh, uh-huh. is when it becomes fit for entertainment because you're not up there to Definitely. therapize yourself. It actually has to be for others. Yeah. And that little step uh-huh. back does rewrite the story a bit in your brain. And so that can be very powerful. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was going to say, I could see how um, how it just becomes really, what's the word, synergistic. Right? Yeah. Because you as a comedian are there to please. 
you're there to to foster that connection you're do you're there to do something you you love and yet you want to use this i mean back to the beginning of our conversation you want to use the material as a way that will make people laugh but also make them feel and feel connected and not alone so i could see how you're you know how did you say it um you were powerless over the narrative i mean to me you don't need to be a comic to be powerless over your narrative. I know. Right? But when you realize that you can reclaim that, that's the game changer in in, in all of our lives. Yeah. Right? I mean, yes. that, it just, it feels, that feels like the public service announcement. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, and this took a long time because I think when we retell stories from our life, uh, even if things that we went through, they're really hard. There is a tendency mm-hmm. to want to rewrite how we were in the moment. You know, we want to be better than we were. We want to be more heroic than we were. We want to, you know, that's where maybe... a really good comedian comes in. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to tell you how fucking bad I was. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, I think you know, over the years, I've learned, and it was it was by complete accident that I I and you know, a lot of people talk about this, but I learned personally that when I was able to actually go, no, this I'm going to write about me not being great and me having thoughts I was yeah. not proud of and acting acting in a way that looking back I was not proud of those are the moments that afterwards people go oh my god that that is that's the connection like of course everyone wants to see the phoenix rise yeah. from the ashes and wants to see you fall and then rise again and be mm-hmm. better than ever but the emotional connection is when we are talking about right. um, you know the the real crux of our struggle and how you're you know, you you don't do it beautifully and you don't do it brilliantly. And what what does messy look like for people on a personal level? And that it's okay. And that once you admit it, it's okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh my God. So much in that. I mean, <laughs> it, totally. I, when I think about, no, no, but since you're like, even you were saying a little while ago where, you know, you feel lonely at times and where, where you mess up, where you have the courage to reveal that, like, Again, like pu- that feels like public service number one, right? Because so many people are lonely and we, so many of us just feel like, oh, we can't reveal our truths. So if somebody else will have the courage to reveal it for us, then it's a huge amount of permission to say, oh my God, me too, right? I mean, I, and yes. even with the, you know, the Me Too movement, obviously that was somewhat different, but it was this like a uh, clarion call to say, we're not alone in these things that we've experienced, whether it's happening to us or because we're humans and we're flawed and we're vulnerable. So that, I mean, it just, it is a great gift for you to have that courage that to give expression to what is really, really common. And it's like constantly evolving because it's not like I, I am able to live in that world all the time. There was mm-hmm. even recently, you know, I, I go to have a mammogram every yeah. year as as uh, many women do. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I my feed, my social media feed is often of women in the actual place where the mammogram machines are and they're taking mm-hmm. selfies with a little bit like hey everybody I'm getting my mm-hmm. mammogram you know early prevention da, da, da. I and I love those and I'm proud that those pe- women can do that but that is not how I feel about it any single because I'm I'm mm-hmm. still so that was such a traumatic event every single time that appointment's in the calendar I think about it I get to the I I get to the place I am wrecked with anxiety. Every waiting room, it feels like a torture chamber until I get that you can go and you're praying. All of a sudden, you're in in magical thinking mode. You're looking at every expression on people, trying to make it into a fortune-telling device. I mean, it's a wild mindset. And I was like, this is why I don't take a photo of myself in the room and are like hey yeah. everybody 10 years out because i don't feel that way yeah well thanks for sharing that and i i'm <laughs> sure there are going to be women that listen and watch this podcast no for me me listen yeah this is going to run toward the end of october breast cancer awareness month and obviously it'll keep running but i just i i do think again in the spirit of keeping it real you know and i have uh friends that are breast cancer survivors and there's a lot of hugging and high five high-fiving and cheering and yet to tell that scary truth of um, while there's that, that joyfulness, you're 10 years out, great, but that there is that, that scary part that you're being honest about. And it, that also feels like it's a public service announcement because nobody wants to be the person that's talking about what's scary. Not, or not very yeah. often anyway. And I think, I think we, it's, it's also scary. And I think we always want to interact with each other. Like you're good, right? You're good. 
you're good. And sometimes yeah. mm -hmm. being a survivor doesn't mean that it's over. It just feels like it's over for now. But you, yeah. you know, when you live in that space uh, and, you know, so you have to do different things to, I don't know, make your felt, yourself feel good about it. It would be great if the medical industry could just come back to you and be like, that is over forever. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, is there anything, I mean, just in the spirit of, of uh, being a survivor and breast cancer awareness, awareness month, anything, you know, when you think about just other than keeping it real about your experience, anything else that, that you like to try to communicate to um, either, you know, women or their families or, you know, people for whom this is really um, personal? Yeah. Or, I yeah, mean, I, to home. I will admit I made a big mistake when I went through it, which is I didn't tell a lot of people. And it was because I, I think Very I just many. had such a hard time processing it myself. And I was so distraught and I didn't want to be a downer. And I didn't want to yeah. have people to be like, ah, because, you know, you bring oh, up God, cancer. That really messes with your identity for yeah. somebody like you, who I is know. this source of joy and laughter so that's a, that's kind of a, like a little like double screw you up kind of thing it seems like yeah and you know you say to someone i have cancer and you get a lot of their garbage back mm -hmm. like some people are great but a lot of people are just in mm -hmm. such fear and you know sometimes you have to field weird questions they'll be mm -hmm. like well what did you do like oh my god what did i do so it would be great. It <laughs> like, would what be does great. That even mean? <laughs> I don't, I mean, if that's because they want to hear that they're not going to get it. And it would be great if I could just be like, let me tell you, on um, October 15th of 1999, I licked a lead pipe, you know, or whatever. And they're like, oh, exactly. well, I never did don't that. Don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. everyone wants a reason. Uh, so I was trying to protect myself because right. I was afraid of all of these things. But that, in hindsight, was wrong. Was wrong. You need a village. You need mm -hmm. a support system. Yeah. Even if it's three great people, even if it's two great people, but you you have, or even if it's a, a therapist, a great therapist, whatever it is, you need a system. And living in it alone and thinking I can put my head down and just get through this. It's, it's not, it's not healthy. Don't do that. That's my, that's my mm -hmm. advice from where I've been. Yeah. Seek out people who get you. You don't have to get on the loudspeaker, you know, at, at, at a stadium and tell people, unless that feels good to you, it's then not... get out the blowhorn, tell, tell everyone and get everyone to do yeah, things get, for get you. There. Get at any time says, anytime someone says, what can I do? Give them a job. Tell them. <laughs> yeah. Go like, Give can them you come over next week? Yeah, just go like bring over some soup. Can you come over next week and do some laundry? Like give them a mm -hmm. job. <laughs> give them a job. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's something that we've covered a lot on this show and other uh, uh, sort of venues for the the work that I and my team at Your Tango yeah. do. Just this idea of um, when somebody's going through grief, and let's face it, even, you know, you're still alive and you're going through breast cancer, but there is a grief because there is a loss of innocence. It's like, yeah. You know, yeah, you're going through something, but it's scary. And um, so this idea of like taking the initiative to show up and, and sometimes it's appropriate to ask, what can I do? Other times it's like, just just find something really thoughtful and caring to do and just do it. Like, yeah. don't wait for permission. That's what Absolutely. I say. Yeah. And, but I also think if someone really just says that to you, I, I am a firm believer in literally just go, you know what? I'd like some flowers. Just take, just say, say something, yeah. anything, anything that might make you feel good. I mean, listen, that is amazing. Okay, that is like, I mean, public service announcement announcement number four on our show or whatever it is. You know, like genuinely, because so often we we end up just like, nah, nah, nah. And I'm, I think in part it's resonating with me because I'm one of these people like, nah, I'm good. I got to like, right. you know, I'm like, like crumbling under pressure. I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. And to say, hey, this would feel really good to me is such a wonderful act of self-care. And back to the giving permission, you know, you... um. I feel like you gave permission in, you know, in, in what you're talking about that's so personal that, you know, it enables people to go, okay, me too. But I also feel like this idea of giving permission to people to say, hey, this is what I want in a world where we're not supposed to do that. We're not right? supposed, we're supposed to do to that. We're supposed to be good. And that's, yeah, and that's, that's BS, right? We should oh, say, yeah. I want flowers and I would like this particular flower. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I actually love that. I mean, I think, and I think, it's, I, I have to say, I think especially as 
women were sort of expected to handle it. There's like a certain amount of like, yeah, you'll, oh, you'll handle it. And so to just yeah, come back. Uh, yeah, to- I mean, 100%. That's- mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to come back with a thing. You know what? If you want to get a couple people together and buy me a nice facial. I mean, if that's your kind of thing. I'm just throwing out ideas right now. But I yeah, did. Yeah. I, I watched someone yeah. else do the flowers thing and I co-opted it. And someone did say to me, what can I do for you right now? And I was like, I love, I love fresh flowers if you want to send some. And they I- were so happy to have something to do. And maybe, and maybe the other person wasn't, but too bad. (laughs) Yeah, I do not. I do not want to give you a facial. Sorry. Um, No, but that, like, but, but in all seriousness, I mean, it's just, it's really, it's an interesting dynamic because so often you'll think, you know, and then some people be like, oh no, I'm not a, I'm not a flowers person. And then you're like, oh, I don't want to be the, you know, like I'm trying to do something nice and now I'm guessing and now I'm feeling stressed. So I love that. Okay. We are getting close to the end, and this has been a um, uh, amazing. But as a as a comic, I haven't given you a lot of chance to like be funny. <laughs> so, what are your? Okay. I, I mean, but I, you know, at the same time, this whole show, getting open, is is really about you know how do we connect and and um, talk about some of these things that are harder in service to um, our our audience and to one another. So I, I so appreciate your spending so much time sharing what's personal to you and some of these challenges in your life and how you've gone through them and how you've um, um, wrestled back power over the narrative. But what in your experience in, um, in doing your show, uh, uh, parenting, parent, parenting is a joke. I was going to say, yeah, parenting is a joke. Funniest, funniest parent st- parenthood story, either, either yours or someone else's, or one that you completely made up. Any of those will, <laughs> any of those will do. I mean, there's so many snippets because I'm talking primarily to stand-up comics, uh, but, but just funny people in general. Yeah. And little tiny snippets come up of just stuff that has happened. Um, I was just talking to a woman the, the other day. You know, when you have small kids, of course, that's when you're really scatterbrain and you're overloaded. Uh, because you're still learning the job Mm -hmm. and she was saying that she was on stage as a comedian performing and reached into her back pocket and there was a diaper like she forgot that she left the house Uh wearing a pair of jeans and so a diaper just fell on the stage and she was at like you know a nightclub at 10 p.m and everyone was like what and they assumed it was like her depends and then she was like no 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 i'm not i'm not quite at depends i mean i could be but no this is actually my kids oh my god that's actually I mm-hmm. went uh, early on, you know, I was doing that thing where my bag, I, I I go out at night to perform and my bag that was my purse also had stuff in for having a little kid around. So it had snacks and it had wipes, all this kind of stuff. And I was yeah. just a little out of it with my life. And I reached into my bag to get a lipstick at in the green room and my hand squished something. And it was... It was a banana that I think had been there for about a week oh. and a half. <laughs> oh my god! And uh, just so you know, what you do with that person, it everybody? Depends, right? You, uh, you, yeah, you bury that purse in the ground. That purse is done. That purse is you can't you can't get uh, two week banana. <laughs> You're not wiping it out. <laughs> with the yeah. No, that was it. That was like goodbye. Oh my god! Goodbye. Um, goodbye to that purse. But I also, I have a very, I have a great kid yeah, no. and he is, he's experimenting with comedy and he was doing this thing where he was stopping people on the street and then yelling because of course, eight year old boy, this was, he, he was like seven when he started this, is obsessed with body parts and bathroom humor. And he would look at a was that? stranger and just yelps because he thought it was the funniest oh. word. Yeah. I, listen, my boys are 11 I'm- and 14 and- <laughs> We talk about body parts a lot, right? Because I want to make sure that it's like, you know, like, and you got to start young, right? Yes. Like how to protect them. So that's, I, so you're, we could hang together. That the, We, we go, we go through all the body parts and we'll say them. And my kids think it's so funny when I say it, when I'm like, scrotum or whatever. And they're like, Wah! oh, they <laughs> like, love it. Like, we're just going to normalize it. They love it. Yeah. yeah so, no. and, and then. Like vagina. We're like, yeah, no, then, oh, no, 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 yeah. And then I told him that Why? he shouldn't say that. And he came up with a new joke where he was yelling out in public, my age. Mm-hmm. He was obsessed with that. Oh. And I was like, no, I'm... do not yell out. My... He would just yell, <laughs> my 
my mom. And then he would yell at my age. And he was like, he was like, you don't oh, like that? Hey. And I literally was like, you know what? Go back to penis. I want you to go back. To- <laughs> Wait, <laughs> roll it back. That is actually hilarious. <laughs> that is so funny. Well, let, let me ask you, because I feel like at that age, reverse psychology worked. It doesn't now. I'm, let me tell you, when they turn 11, there's no reverse psychology. So does it would it work for you to say, listen, you can say at mom's age all day long. And then he'd be like, yeah, no, I don't want to do that because she's giving me permission. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we've we've certainly done that a few times. And it, it's, ju- it's just on the cusp of not working for sure. Because yeah. he, he is very, he loves... Uh, what it may be more, most kids like he can hook in pretty close and quickly to what we're a little sensitive about or what we're trying to do okay. and then he'll double down on that so yeah the other day I was like nah. I was doing it with homework I was like I don't know I don't think you need to do homework I mean I know a lot of people that failed school and they have good jobs and he was like really yeah. and I was like well <laughs> yeah I think so I, I was like they're not not the greatest well, jobs but you know whatever I if you don't think homework matters I'm good with that man I left the room and he was just like writing in his book oh my god that's hilarious like, oh, very good very good see it worked ninja mom yep. mom still got the ninja move <laughs> well i'll say that mom I hack mean, what yeah what i've done with my boys um you know they've got all these um slang words and so yes. to um yeah to co-opt their language and i'll be at dinner with a friend and she has like teenage kids and i'll and she's like texting with them i'm like all right text this and then they text and they're like who are you with (laughs) it's like you know and i'm trying to even think of some of the latest oh they're calling each other cuddy now just cuddy now now your your boy is is like c-u-d-i i don't even know what it's like i'm like what does that mean is that like cutie no cuddy it's like your buddy but it's cuddy and I hope my kids are telling me the truth oh and not totally punking me. And it's a word that's like really, really not okay to say. Hilarious. I'm like, I'm like, hey, Cuddy. And they're like, no, you just yeah. totally like said something that can never be said before. You're going to be, you know, like canceled forever. Oh, yeah. yeah no, when I try fun. to co op that lang- lingo, he's in more like skippity. He says skippity. That's like the, of oh, this oh, face. Um, uh, yeah. My, I say that with, yeah, our, our younger son, they're running the um, uh, skippity toilet. Oh yeah, it's the skibbity. It's the skibbity, and I'll I'll say skibbity right back to them, and they're like, ah. I know exactly. It's literally like, grating on their ears. Uh-huh. I was, and I, yeah, I actually like, said to my son all day long. Yeah, I said mm-hmm. I watched. I said I watched about twenty of those episodes, and I loved them. I thought they were so funny, and he was like, uh. mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, no, oh. it's like uh, you just you just wrecked it for me, mom. Thanks for yeah. nothing. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's so fun. I, you know, I, I I would have loved to have a daughter too, but it is it's so fun to be um, a mom of boys. And I feel like, you know, I, I was told this a lot when my kids were little. It just keeps getting better, and in so many ways, I mean, it it totally does. And yet, like they say, uh, small when they're small, small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. You know, you see how it, it you know, as a as a parent, it changes. I always call my boys my uninvited Buddhas because they taught me. <laughs> Whoa, have oh, they yeah. ever taught me a lot? Yeah, no, it's uh, if you listen the correct way, y- you're like, wow, because they do have profound thoughts beyond their age. And then like the next second, whatever, uh, like a, a Monopoly board is tossed across the room because they're not doing yeah. well. So I find that uh, this going back and forth between sort of this this wisdom and then yeah. just complete id reactive behavior, pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I bet I would conjecture that as they get, as your son gets older, the material will become even sharper. I mean, as you know, as you've described, so much of your material is about yourself. And holy smokes, do teen and tweens ever show you yourself as a mom? <laughs> like in a way that is brings you to your knee. I mean, talk about rising as a phoenix. Like at least for me, like bring me to my knees, and then it's like okay, I know what to do with this now, right? Yeah. And it, it feels like back to that being a public service to, you know, to help us as flawed individuals that are doing the best we can and recognizing that that is, I mean, incredibly common as, especially as a working parent, especially as yes. a working mom, you know, for these kids to reveal our, our blind spots and, um, you know. you know, and I am open to that because I, I find that there is this kind of thing that happens, if, especially because I'm a little bit of an older mom, that my friends and yeah. I will get together and we're all, you know, it's it, you see it all the time. Like our childhood was 
just free and dangerous and come back mm-hmm. at dinner time, you know, lack of supervision. And then yeah, we always totally. we always talk about how our kids are not having that experience and how we had this experience and it was rough and this and that. And then we always cap it by going like, and you know, come on, we're fine. Look at us. We're fine. And I always. <laughs> we're not fine. <laughs> yeah, I always react and I go, really? You're fine? I'm not fine. Like, I'm like, yeah. I, I am like currently like doused in CBD oil under a weighted blanket. You know, yeah. what, what about that is fun? Yeah, no, I know. It's like, <laughs> all right, let's just keep it real. Oh, Fira, you are amazing. Thank you so much for being on Getting Open. Before we wrap up, um, where do people find you? Moms Unhinged. I need more of that. We all, all of us moms need more of that. Like, give us, give us a scoop. How do we we follow Uh, you? How do we find you? Yeah, please follow me everywhere at Ophira E. That's right. At Ophira was taken, everybody. So I'm at Ophira E on the socials. And I have a website, OphiraEisenberg.com, where I put live dates. And I've been doing a bunch of work with the this amazing group of moms originally out of Denver, Colorado. Shout out to and, Colorado. Yeah, and they put together a show that is a it, it's a different comics every time who are all moms called Moms Unhinged. And it's traveling across the country. And I'm on a whole bunch of them and they're, they're always fun. So if you get it, if you want some live comedy, that's specifically talking to moms who are parents, uh, women, this is for you. I do. I want that. I want that. I want to see you there. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much. If you really appreciate your being on our show. My pleasure. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks so much for tuning in again to Getting Open. If you are not following our show, please do so. Please subscribe wherever you get the show, whether it's on iHeart, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, you name it. I love hearing from my audience. Please email me at gettingopen at yourtango.com. I also love hearing or reading your comments, I should say. Again, wherever you get your podcasts. So let me know what you think. Let me know what you love. Let me know what you'd like to see more of. Let me know what you'd like to see less of. Guests that you would love for me to have on my show. And with that, thanks again for tuning in. And we'll see you next time on Getting Open.